Good evening. I'd like to call the meeting to order, please. Ms. Uh, Campbell, would you call the roll for us? Mr. Hannigan? Here. Mr. Derman? Here. Mr. Loop? Here. Mr. Harrell? Here. Mr. Nation? Here. Mr. Jeter? Here. Mrs. Seeley? Here. Mrs. Drucker? Here. Mr. Betancourt? Here. Mr. Womack? Here. Mr. Hersey? Here. Mrs. Mullet? <coughs> Mr. Kuzan? Here. Mrs. Belisario? Here. Mrs. Heinz? Here. Thank you so much. Would you please rise and join us in the invocation and pledge led by Mr. Nation? Let us pray. O oh God, our times are in your hand, and look with favor, we pray, upon us as we begin this new year, that we may continue to grow in your wisdom and grace as we seek to fulfill the responsibilities and duties of the office to which we have been elected for the well-being and the betterment of the children, parents, and educators of this parish. This prayer we offer in your holy name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Nation. I'd like to welcome everyone to our first committee meeting for um, Human Resources and Education for the year 2016. Our um, first item on the agenda is persons requesting time, and we did not have anyone sign up for that. So we'll move on to approval of the minutes from the committee as a whole meeting held on December 3rd, 2015. Do I have a motion to accept those minutes? I have a motion by Mr. Kuzan, a second by Ms. Drucker. Do we have any comments from the board? Got comments from the public? All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Abstain? We have an abstention by Ms. Seeley. All right, thank you. So we'll move on to instruction, and our first item is the social studies textbook adoption, and we have Dr. Mott to give us that report. Good evening. Good evening. A year has already passed since uh, we started our math textbook adoption, so we move on to the next subject. And tonight it is social studies, so I'm going to give you an overview of that process. The requirement to purchase textbooks is outlined in Bulletin 741, states that we must provide instructional materials for all students, have a proper procedure for selection, we may use state funds to buy books off of the state list, or we may use those funds to buy non-adopted instructional materials. And our order must be submitted to Publishers Depository between March 15th and May 15th. Um, I gave you a large copy of the textbook adoption timeline. This timeline is an outline of what we do each month to guarantee that our students and teachers receive books and materials before the next school year. To do a textbook adoption, you have to do a lot of research. The research, um, we have different ways that we do it. One of the first things is the National Council of Social Studies Convention. This year that convention was in New Orleans and we sent four delegates there and part of their um, task was to go into the exhibit halls and research the publishers who were showing their wares. Another part of our research is to look at the Department of Education's tiering system. The department takes resources in, they review them, and they put them in tiers, with tier one being the one with the most quality. We always do informal res review of resources. That's done every day in our jobs. We do that um, when we go out to other districts, our schools, talking to teachers. Um, and then we also look at what other districts are using to make sure that we don't miss anything in our research. Once we have a, an initial list of publishers, we start making phone calls to those publishers and we ask them basic requirements. Are you able to provide samples by our review window? Are your copyright dates current? What are your copyright dates? 
do you have the ability to supply textbooks to a very large school system? And this year, we are looking at supplying all third through 12th grade students social studies textbooks. Are you able to get the teacher additions to us by April 15th and get all textbooks delivered to school book supply by the end of May? And then the last question we ask them, are you willing to enter into contract with us? So far, the publishers meeting our review criteria are listed here. They're in three categories. I have it as K-5, but we're looking at 3-5. But the reason that I have K-5 up here is so that we have the ability to expand if needed. And for K-5, we look for continuity, and the way that we do that is we see if the publisher has a series for K-1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Then when you look at 6-8, it's a little different. The um, material is starting to get a little harder. Some publishers don't go up that high because some of the uh, independent publishers start identifying things like Louisiana history. And not all publishers make a Louisiana history book. Um, but we do have more because National Geographic has a, a specific book. So does Claremont Press, Gib Smith. So you have more for 6-8. Same with high school. High school has very many subjects to cover with our social studies and there are many publishers out there who meet the criteria for high school. The preview, preview process, that will be starting in a couple of weeks and that's a time when we set the textbooks out around the district. Two sites that are not schools, Harrison and Brooks, and then at all the schools who are adopting the books. We put the books out and anybody has the opportunity to go in, flip page by page if they would like through all the publishers and give us feedback. They have to sign in and we do offer feedback forms for community members who go and preview the books. At a more uh, in-depth level of evaluation, we have school level and community committee members. The committee members do take the books page by page and they use a rubric to guide their evaluation. Then on February 27th, once again, we will be having a textbook adoption at Lakeshore High School. And that's the time when the publishers present their wares. They have an opportunity to perform their book, make their book come alive. Committee members who are no nominated by their principals or community members or parents who are nominated by PTA, the schools, or perhaps one of you, once they are on the committee, they have responsibilities. They are to review the textbooks, as I said, using a rubric to guide their evaluation. The school level committee members are to discuss with school faculty their findings. They are to consider input, whether it be verbal or on the forms from faculty, parents, community members. And they attend the formal presentations in February. After the formal presentations, committee members have the opportunity to clarify any misconceptions that teachers may have seen in the books before the meeting, the presentations. And then they take input once again after those formal presentations. The last thing that they do is the committee members vote to represent the majority of the school. The formal presentations by the publishers, once again, is at Lakeshore High School on the 27th at 8 a.m. It's committee members only, both school level, community, and parent committee members. We also send an invite out to our local private schools so that they can see what textbooks are out there also, and any board members or supervisors who would like to attend. And that's where the publishers do their extended presentations. Committee members' official vote must be turned in by March the 1st. We tally those votes very quickly, and then we will be ready to present the outcome of the Social Studies Textbook Committee on March the 3rd to you. And then, of course, our hope is that on March the 10th that the committee selection is approved. 
if this election is approved, our next step, if you look at your timeline, would be to publicize the vote and continue with the process, which would be starting to order those teacher materials, getting the books to school book supply, and so forth. That concludes the overview for the social studies textbook adoption. Thank you, Dr. Mott. Let's see if board members have questions on that. Do we have any questions from board members? Um, Mr. Nation, do you have a question? Yes, Ms. Hines. Thank you, Dr. Mott. Question about, uh, two questions, I guess. First, um, regarding the rubric, uh, can, is the rubric been developed yet or what? Yes, can, sir. The, the rubric has been developed. Okay. What is, uh, can you describe the rubric for, for me or for us? Certainly. It, Okay, the rubric is a set of evaluative statements, and what it does is it breaks it down into six categories. For example, content is a category, organization of the book, and so forth. And so when a teacher is, or a committee member is going through the book, they read a statement. The statement may be a very simple one that says um, maps, diagrams, et cetera, are correct, they're accurate, and then it might go into the color. So it it's very, starts very simple and it get, gets complex where it talks about um, fact versus opinion. Um, does it, there's one question that we added on the math textbook last year. Um, does it address the concerns, cultures, whatever, of the community? Because each community has a you know, set of beliefs that they would like addressed. Um, so they work through this rubric. And let's go back to the first one. If you're looking at maps and diagrams, the teacher would go through the book, look at those maps and diagrams, and then she would rate that category. So it might be a one, it might be a four. So each evaluative statement there to take and go through the book and judge where they feel that particular publisher feels on that statement. And then in the end, they add up the numbers and then they get a final score. And there's also on there an opportunity for them to offer comments, uh, questions that might need to be clarified at the presentations, like that. Thank you, and one final question is, do we have a sense of how much uh, this, the textbooks will cost? Yes, sir. Um, I can't give you an exact, I'll give you a ballpark. If the ballpark is three million. Right. You're welcome. You're welcome. Ms. Trannigan. Thank you, Beth. Uh, Dr. Mott, I, two quick, well, a comment and a question. I, I'm really pleased that you uh, think about inviting the private schools. I think that really shows the community spirit and, you know, that we can, if we bought a big purchase, could they participate in that? purchase and that at that price <laughs> well what one of the requirements of the publishers participating want to play they have to keep their prices at the same level no matter if we buy it or if st. scholastica buys it they have to keep their prices okay. at the same level. Right. Well, that's that's good and I, I was a little confused about the uh, Louisiana history part. C can you get a separate book that just covers Louisiana history or it all has to be in one? No. Yes, sir. Currently, our book in eighth grade um, breaks the series. Um, it is just, it's, I think it's a Gibbs Smith. It stands alone because when it was evaluated the last time, they felt, the teachers felt like, this company who only publishes eighth grade books for individual states covered our state history the best. So yes, we will break away from a series for um, eighth grade. Stadium. Okay, good. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Darman. Thank you, Ms. Heinz. <coughs> Ms. Mon, when you're looking at the group of publishers, and we talked about the tier one um, rating that the state would give them do all of these meet tier one well sir um, here is the issue that we're having currently the textbook adoption is to happen this year and textbooks need publishers need a certain amount of time to be able to supply the textbooks to get to a school system the state as far as their tiering process goes they have told us that they are not going to publish the tiers until March the 1st. So 
we are um, at a we're not going to be able to use their tiering because if we do we will not have textbooks at the start of school for our students next year but with that being said we have um, a very comprehensive rubric we did very well with the how we did last year and I have full confidence that a committee of 150 to 170 will be able to review and choose the best book for our system okay um, that was a nice very political answer there <laughs> yes it was <laughs> well, so I maybe we can submit that. to the state that whatever we select is tier one well sir <laughs> I mean we do believe hopefully that they will have the same feelings as the people that represent St. Tammany Parish and hopefully they will but if not we believe what's best for St. Tammany is what we should follow and having this big group of people we should be able to get that consensus well I appreciate it I know we're in a new year but some things never change so we appreciate y'all's efforts Mr. Kuzan yes in the evaluation process if a person is not nominated to be on a committee can they volunteer um, well I, I mean it certainly will look at what if, if you have a person that you would like to nominate um, we are open I mean last year we took everybody who was nominated and they have to be willing to make that commitment of all the things on there and if they are willing to make that time commitment and be dedicated to the process sure I mean we have to do cut cut them off at a certain amount um, you know of volunteers because the ones who will be teaching are the teachers so last year we um, stopped the uh, amount of community members at 10 percent and it worked out perfectly um, and we took everybody who came across my desk thank you you're welcome any other questions from board members Thank you very much, Dr. Mott. We appreciate your report. Thank you. All right, our next report is Early Childhood Coordinated Funding, and we have Ms. Lane for that report. Thank you. Good evening. I'm here tonight to share with you the latest and greatest, <laughs> the Early Childhood Coordinated co Funding. According to Bulletin 140, our Early Childhood Network servicing children from birth to five, we are required to submit a coordinated funding plan. And so that was in collaboration with everybody in the network, including child care centers, Head Start, and our public school system. The things that we were supposed to keep in mind, and we did keep in mind as we created our plan, was parent choice, because it's very important that parents are able to choose the highest quality and where they feel their children will be best be served in early childhood uh, settings. The second is demand. Can within a geographical area we fulfill the needs of our children to be serviced? And capacity. Can the site itself actually service the children that they're asking for funds for? Um, and the funding sources that we have to list, and I'm going to share all of that with you, but LA4 you know about, and this is due to the state by the 18th of January. NSCCD is non-public school early childhood development. Both of those have the same requirements, LA4 NS, and NSECD. The preschool expansion grant is where the public school system collaborates with a child care center, a type three child care center in our network. And if uh, we decided to go for that funding, it would be that there would be a collaboration effort where we would hire the teacher, the public school system would hire the teacher, and that class would be placed in a child care center. And the last one is allocated CCAP seats, and that is child care assistance program. And those seats that we are for funding for are geared to two uh, infants, toddlers, and three-year-olds. Um, before we made the decision on, and to guide our decision, we needed the data to show who needed to be served and how, um, where, you know, where they need, what the ages are, and how are, we, how are we doing with this. So the first column of this shows the, um, based on the number, 
of course you have the, the ages of the children then that number is based on the kindergarten at risk on a birth rate so they're f figuring 1359 are the number of kindergarten children who are at risk therefore in that whole cohort and the kids leading up to kindergarten they kept that same number consistent and I showed you the last line first <laughs> because that is the percent serviced based on what they determined the cohort indicates a need for. The next column shows you the family demand. That means they actually came and applied. So those are the numbers who came and applied. And then the next shows, um, based on the October count, how many were actually enrolled. And the, la the second to last column shows the percent that we uh, serviced that who applied, of those who applied. So you'll notice if you look at the four-year-old line, we are actually servicing 99.6% of those who applied for four-year-olds. The area of need tends to indicate that we could do a better job of servicing threes, twos, ones, and infants. And this next slide is the slide that we would like to share with you and we will be asking for public comment through the website. But this slide shows what we're requesting funds for. Currently, in the 15-16 school year, we have 925 funding for 925 um, children in the LA4 program. We are not requesting more. We're requesting that same 925. Our reason for not requesting more funding is the data shows we're servicing 99.6% of four-year-olds. Um, so there will be no change in the request for funding for LA4. The NSECD program, we, that's located in child care centers. That also services four-year-olds. The seats current are 30. The request for child care centers is to up that to 70, and therefore there's a, a change of increasing it to 40 in their centers. The child care centers are required to find the children to fill these seats. Again, those are the same guidelines as the LA4 guidelines. And as you can see, the pre-K expansion grant, that's four-year-olds. We are servicing our four-year-olds. We're requesting no funding there. The allocated CCAP seats for infants and toddlers, we're requesting no funding. And we have a, this is a new thing, this allocated CCAP seats. So we have one center that currently has three-year-old, uh, two-year-olds who will be turning three. So they have three CCAP seats for three-year-olds and they're requesting for two-year-olds currently so they're requesting three seats for their three-year-olds so in essence they'll be serving no more children who qualify for CCAP but this is a different program insofar as children who qualify qualify for an entire year it is m focused on working with parents and children from f parents who are at work working or going to school is a qualifications for it used to be that they had to requalify regularly they don't it's a whole school year now they've also increased the amount of funding for CCAP so therefore this would give them an established number of seats so that three won't go away it used to fluctuate from month to month depending on who qualified so it would give more stability to the families to know they could stay there all year and more stability to the centers to know that they in fact will um, be able to count on that funding through the year so we are going we're asked just so you know the timeline we asked that anybody from the network submitted to us by December 17th their request um, and that plan was then emailed to all the network men members um, we have got to have everything into the state and you know for January what did I say 18th 17th or 18th and public comments will be accepted until January 13th and we're going to ask that the public comments come through the Talk to Us button on our St. Tammany Parish public, public School website. And we also will be listing the phone number in case people don't have access to computers and need to give us some um, information or feedback about this. And one of the greatest things that just happened is Channel 13 has done a fabulous job. And what they did was worked with our network publicity committee chaired by one of our own early childhood coaches, April Johnson. And they went into child care centers, Head Start, as well as our public schools, to film our children on their journey to kindergarten readiness. And so now you have, you're going to see a, a beautiful film that represents a variety of services, all caring, loving, and providing for our young children. The 
St. Tammany Parish Early Childhood Care and Education Network is comprised of Head Start, local child care centers, and the St. Tammany Parish public school system. Its mission is to provide high quality early childhood care and education to children birth to age five, so that when these children enter kindergarten, they are ready to learn and experience success. The goal of the St. Tammany Parish Early Childhood Care and Education Network is to support young children in their development and have them enter kindergarten ready to learn. Children listen and respond to stories as they develop a love of reading and language in books. They learn how to hold a book correctly and to love books as they develop in the areas of literacy and language. Teachers encourage children to have conversations, ask questions, and speak in complete sentences in order to develop strong language skills. Children enjoy activities such as jumping, throwing, and climbing as they strengthen gross motor skills. Children develop fine motor skills by using hands, fingers, and wrists to manipulate large and small objects. Children also participate in fine arts activities including music and art using different materials, tools, and techniques to express themselves. Dramatic play supports children's creativity and language and builds their self-confidence. The St. Tammany Parish Early Childhood Care and Education Network is working together to ensure that all children are physically, socially, and cognitively ready to achieve success in kindergarten and give all parents in the community access to these high quality early childhood programs. For more information, please contact 985-898-3306. And that concludes our presentation. Do you have any questions? Nice video, Ms. Lane. Yeah. Let's see, they questions <laughs> from board members. Mr. Betancourt. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Hanks. <clears throat> Mrs. Lane, on the second sheet, that thing up at the top, what is the what's the reason for the difference between the applications and then the children served? For instance, on the infants, it was 87, but 49 were served. That those people just didn't qualify, or they just didn't show up, didn't or what? Sh didn't show up. So those are probably people who did not show up because when they apply, they only the applicants who meet the qualifications are recorded. So those would be people who either changed their mind went somewhere else and moved or but they did not come to the program and that's the same for each all the way up to the fours to where you know it was only uh, just a few kids that didn't didn't show up but all the rest of those qualified and yes yes sir okay thank you other board members that have questions mr Derman. thank you Ms. science this line when you look at the um the the number at risk cohort and the number that we estimate and the number that we serve but this is just the at risk yes sir it's only those who qualify for public funds basically our free and reduced lunch population okay which is 185 percent of the poverty level and that is about 40 some odd percent of our student body now in st tammany our whole we're closer to isn't it like 49 or something like that close to 50 percent. So, so we're saying half about I guess. half mm -hmm. and that's the criteria that qualifies for this program is the free and reduced it's free and reduced okay. this year we're currently servicing 59 who are paying tuition also okay because here again I'm just thinking about the other half of this kids that we're not servicing that if we could do something but I mean and one of the reasons we went to that sliding scale for tuition is you have people that might miss this by ten dollars a month right and so we really felt like in order to be um, give access to all children who need these services we would open for tuition where there is space absolutely and, and that was kind of my concept is that we still have 50 percent of the population that really isn't being served or has the possibility to be served but some of those might be in private child care or private preschools so that 
we don't have that number at all. Right. But I'm, uh, it's a great program, and I'm fully supported. I'm just, you. you know, I'm looking at every child out there. I so understand. The, the more we can get involved at an earlier age, the better our school system ends up being whenever they become juniors and seniors and Thank graduate. You. <laughs> so, I mean, I think it's a great idea, a great program. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Mr. Nation. Thank you, Ms. Lane. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hines. The the list at the end, just so that I'm clear, that list that came up on the that scrolled of, the, of those daycare centers or early early childhood centers, are those privately owned? Yes, they're private. Head Start's in there, and we're in there also. Right. But they're privately owned. But the other thing is that they're all part of our network. That's not every child care center. That's all, they're all type 3 child care centers. That means that's the highest level of licensing, and they are participants in our network. That's a requirement to, for all of this. And so if I had a child that needed this service, I could choose one of those. Yes, sir. Choose any one of those um, early childhood centers, and then the... Then how's the, the money, f how does the money follow? Does, I mean. The money for, child care centers receive CCAP right, right. now or NSECD. Gotcha. And that money goes right to them. And then, of course, the LA4 comes through us. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Mr. Derman, that's your another question. It's actually just a comment. Uh, uh, Mr. Nation brought up the, uh, you know, the, the, um, other child care centers and I want to thank them for their partnership along with us because I mean it this is truly a team effort and without them and I know they have to meet a lot of other criteria to qualify and all the paperwork so I mean kudos to them for taking the initiative and taking on the burden that that uh, this extra um, you know paperwork creates but we really appreciate their efforts along with you Thank you. We have to make sure we appreciate Tara and Deneen back here, our two coordinators for early childhood, because um, they lead this network. And I think Ms. Heights, uh, Mr. Harris, right? Is it Harris? Mr. Harris is here as well. He's, um, thank you for coming. Appreciate that. And this is a great partnership between our school system and our communities. And the only way it can work is if everybody's working together. So we should appreciate your support as well. Thank you for being here. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Lang. We appreciate that report. All right, that brings us to item C, which is accountability, and we have Dr. Sanford to discuss that with us this evening. Fultz, board members. Tonight I'm here to give you a data report by the numbers. So let's drill down and talk about accountability tonight. As you all are aware, for grades three through eight, accountability is in the four core areas, math, science, English, and social studies. 100% of the assessment score for the elementary and middle schools come from the standardized testing scores of students. And remember that students get individual scores based upon their performance level. Basic is 100 all the way to advanced, which is 150. Unsatisfactory and approaching basic are counted as zeros. If a school has a junior high with a grade eight, then 95% of the assessment is from the standardized scores, and 5% is fr from what is called the dropout cumulative indicator. And this, in an essence, is the number of credits that a student will earn by the end of their freshman year. That scale starts at 3.5 credits <coughs> all the way to six credits. So the students individually would score 25 points all the way to 150 points. And our junior highs are offering Carnegie unit credits to help with that number. In high school, there is a four quadrant formula. EOC, and there are six EOC tests, English two, English three, American history, 
biology, algebra one, and geometry, and only students scoring at the good or excellent level are awarded points for the purpose of accountability. The grad rate index, that's simply the graduation rate from the time the student enters ninth grade and graduates four years later. Lastly, the grad diploma index, that is the one we call the strength of diploma. Students are awarded credit, if you will, for taking an AP course and the test and scoring a three or higher, having a CLEP score 50 or higher, or if they earn college credit, dual enrollment credit in an academic class. So that is how those points are awarded. And lastly, progress points are awarded both to the district and to the schools based upon student growth, the non-proficient students. And districts and schools can get a maximum of 10 points. And I'm very pleased to report to you tonight, as you have seen in the newspaper, that St. Tammany has retained a district status of an A. And this is a strong indicator to our community because we know that realtors and industry definitely wants to see a school district who is achieving at the highest. And this is used as a marketing tool to draw people to St. Tammany Parish. And we're very pleased with that. So now let's drill down and take a look at what makes up this formula. So our district performance components. If you notice, in the column, there were only two decreases from the whole column. The first is our overall school performance or district performance score. We did take a .8 drop from the year previous. Most of that drop was attributed to an assessment index. And that, again, we have to remember that last year there was quite a bit of controversy with the testing and we did, along with many other districts in the state, take a slight drop. The dropout accumulation index notice went up. So all of those other indicators, we are doing a great job to offset the slight dip that we had. The EOC index was the only one that remained the same as well as the district earning our progress points. So if you look along that line, you know that our ACT is at 21.5, and we're very proud to continue to report being first in that category. Our strength of dip diploma, last year for all of our AP testers, we had 60% of our students who took the test to score the three or higher. We additionally had about over 13,000 college credit hours. Now, not all of those hours count in the formula because some of those are dual enrollment career technical courses, which do not count. And last year was our first year to begin um, the process of CLEP testing, so we'll be collecting data on that as well. And if you notice, our grad cohort rate did increase, so we're doing a better job of getting students across the stage and graduating in four years. With that being said, we have 22 A schools. Those are schools scoring 100 or higher. We have 19 B schools. Those are sco schools scoring 85 or higher. We have 14 C schools, those are schools scoring 70 or higher. We have no Ds and no Fs. In comparison to the year previously, we did have some slight changes. And if you notice there, um, I will just point out, we had six schools of all of our 55 schools that are within just a few points of increasing their letter grade. And I think that's very important to point out, as well as you need to know that in our very small schools, single digit students taking a drop can really make a huge impact as much as a letter grade. And I think it's very important for you to realize that. Our changes, talking about the individual schools, we had four schools increase their letter grade 
and 20 schools increased their SPS number. We had 42 that stayed the same in letter grade, but again, no surprise here that their SPS number did not stay the same because it's very difficult to just maintain even a point one increase or decrease counts. And we had nine schools drop a letter grade, 35 decreased their SPS. Now let's compare that to the state. There are 10 A districts, there are 30 B districts, 21 C's, 9 D's, and 2 F districts. Overall, the state's SPS also took a slight dip, but remained a letter grade of a B. Of course, we always are competitive in St. Tammany Parish, so let's take a look at those top 10. And you see some of the same schools listed as the year prior. One of the things I found most interesting, seven out of the 10 top 10 districts did take a slight dip, so I thought that that was noteworthy. Also, as I added up all of the schools in this top 10 list, as well as all of the enrollment in this top 10 list, I would like to point out that St. Tammany Parish alone makes up 25% if you want to talk about just number of schools or number of pupils. I think that's significant and I'm very proud of the work that our educators are doing as well as other stakeholders. Lastly, I would like to give a big shout out to all of our educators, our community stakeholders, our parents. We value education in St. Tammany Parish, and I think it's very evident that we are trying to educate the whole child each and every day. Thank you, Dr. Sanford. Thank you. Uh, would, I think everyone uh, in this room deserves a big hand because they were a part of this push it was it was not only you know you said it's valuable to our community but it's very valuable f for our teachers our administrators our students and our, our parents and the public also we were very proud of the work that everyone did and, and I'm proud of the board for supporting everyone also in that work so with agree. that being said big hand to everyone and we'll see if board members have questions sure. on this accountability report. Mr. Hennigan, we'll start with you. Thank you, Ms. Heinz. Um, the, Regina, uh, just two questions, I guess. Sure. One is, uh, we, you know, the park test was advertised as uh, showing how different states could be competitive across the country. And I've yet to see any comparison between say, uh, Louisiana schools and the other 10 states that took park has that been released yet do we know to my knowledge that has not been released because louisiana was one of the first states to actually release their data released. okay so we still don't know we where we stand know. on that okay and and then the obvious uh, kind of question nagging me is we st tammany took a little stronger stance against common core knowing that the state was going to do more assessment along the common core lines you think that hurt our sps scores well um there was a way to negate that impact this year but it's my understanding that that was a one-time uh, fix if you will for that so students who had previous scores who opted out of the test those previous <coughs> scores were used so if a student did not have previous scores then they were calculated as a zero if I can follow up on that too yes, a little bit, I, I do believe it did have an impact. Um, the opt out part for many of our students, they chose not to opt out because we had a relationship with the principals and the teachers. And for many of these students, they chose to take the test, but I'm not sure that they or their family gave it the same level of importance that maybe they did when they knew that it was a different test and not you know related to common core state standards we'll never be able to s prove that is true but I really do believe that and I know there was a lot of discussion amongst the state on how they were going to handle the schools and the school systems that opted out and at the end of the day they were not penalized at all for they were given a one-year grace period for not op 
for, for allowing them to opt out. So we don't know. I still believe we did the right thing by encouraging our students to take the test. And I think we did the right thing as a school system by honoring and valuing the decision of each individual parent and doing what they thought was best for their child. And that, at the end of the day, that's the most important thing, that we're here to support the parents, but we realize that parents have to make their own decisions, and we want to be a part of that team with them. So it's hard to determine, but I think it did have some impact. Thank you. All right. Anyone else have questions? Mr. Bancourt. Thank you, Mrs. Heinz. Dr. Sanford, on page two at the bottom, that okay. formula components? Yes. The dropout credit accumulation index. That means that we had the number increased, so that means that we had more students who were earning more points getting more Carnegie unit courses completed. 3.5 earns you points. So by the end of the ninth grade year, a student who has earned points in that capacity count so and our junior highs are giving more Carnegie unit points so that is another reason that we attribute we had growth but that's not somebody that dropped out of school well if a student does not earn Carnegie unit credit at least three and a half three and a half credits then they do not earn points so that's why it's called dropout or credit accumulation okay but the 131 to 136, that was good, right? That is good. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Darman. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm looking at the progress points, points. on the yes. score, and it's capped out at 10. At 10, yes. And so, I'm sorry, go ahead. So a school district, our school, has to have a certain number of students, and there's a pro projected growth. And these students are unsat, so to speak, and they exceed their expected growth. That's okay. how those points are calculated. And those are calculated at the state level. And like you're saying, if you exceed it, you don't get any additional credit. You, you're capped at the 10. But if you don't meet it, you could you get penalized for whatever there is. You just don't get the progress points. Well, yeah, but you <laughs> get penalized in some of the other categories, too. True. Okay. I was just curious if if we could take all of our credits that we had if we if we exceeded the 10 and if we did so by how much would it be to help offset some of the other negative things I'm just curious but mm -hmm. maybe at some later point you may be able to enlighten us on that or do you ever get those I figures? don't get that report well apparently the other states don't get their reports back either so okay <laughs> I'll leave it alone any other comments from board members? Thank you very much, Thank Dr. You. Sanford. All right, um, we'll have our announcements from the president at the end of the business affairs meeting. Thank you, Mr. Loop. So uh, there's no further business, and I declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you all for being here this evening. I'm going to call this meeting to order for the St. Tammany Parish School Board Committee as a whole meeting for January 7, 2016. Business Affairs and Administrative. Roll call, please. Mr. Derman. Here. Mr. Hannigan. Here. Mrs. Heinz. Here. Mr. Loop. Here. Mr. Harrell. Here. Mr. Nation. Here. Mr. Jeter. Here. Mrs. Seeley. Here. Mrs. Drucker. Here. Mr. Betancourt. Here. Mr. Womack. Here. Mr. Hersey. Mrs. Mullet, Mr. Kuzan, yeah. Mrs. Belisario. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to dispense with the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, so we're going to move to item three, which is persons requesting time on, on the agenda, and no one has done that either. So we're going to move to item four, which is approval of the minutes for the committee as a whole meeting held December 3rd, 2015. Do I have a motion? I'll move. Moved by Mr. Womack, second by Mr. Bettencourt. Any comments from the public? I mean from board members, I'm sorry. I'm seeing none from the public. Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. 
Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Abstain. Uh, Ms. Seeley abstains, please. Due to absence. Thank you. We won't hold it against you. Um, yes, ma'am. So moving on to item five, which is consideration of hourly rate of pay for cafeteria monitors. Mr. Javion. Thank you, Mr. Darman, members of the board. As you well know, a few years ago, this board passed a policy whereby we employ cafeteria monitors to help, of course, in our cafeterias. This is, uh, has a lot to do with the collective bargain agreement and giving our teachers some duty-free lunch. Uh, so these people come in, and this is basically our elementary schools, and we employ them for uh, a two-hour block of time. And this board adopted a pay schedule of paying those uh, particular personnel if they did not have a high school diploma, the minimum wage of $7.25 an hour, or if they had a high school diploma, $8 an hour. What we're asking tonight is, is that we move all of our cafeteria monitors to be paid at the rate of $8 an hour. I think this may help us in getting a few more of our uh, some people to come in and help us out with this because this is in the middle of the day and they're having to get out for just two hours and so it, it may make it a little bit better for us to give you just a little bit of background probably 14 to 17 percent of our cafeteria monitors do not have a high school diploma if we were to pay them at eight dollars a rate uh, an hour based on two previous years we're probably looking at an increase in the budget of about a thousand dollars for the entire year so we're asking that we do that it does take some manpower to track those with the individual pay rates we pay all of our other substitutes eight dollars an hour and we're asking for that increase for those that only have that do not have a high school diploma okay thank you do i have a motion okay mr womack made the motion second by Ms. Mullet, any conversation or questions from board members regarding the motion? Ms. Heinz. This might be slightly off topic, but is there, do they go through any training? They go through our, uh, just an orientation. They come through our substitute office. They are on our substitute list, and that's how principals get these people to come to the schools. So they have to come through and do a background check. They do an orientation. We give a very little training with our, with our cafeteria monitors. The schools basically take care of that when they get to the schools. All right, thank you so much. Sure. Okay, Mr. Bedencourt. Thank you, Mr. Dermott. Mr. Jabia, would you explain what exactly do they do? They actually monitor the kids in the cafeteria while they're eating lunch. They Did serve as a duty behavior Misbehavior and things like that? Yes, sir. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Make sure they eat their vegetables. <laughs> Even the broccoli. <laughs> Even the broccoli. And it allows the teachers to have their lunch. And duty Correct. Duty-free lunch. According to the contract. Mr. Nation, that was your question. Okay. Any other questions from board members? Seeing none. Any from the public? Seeing none. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? So ordered. Thank you. Um, next is consideration of radios for tr transportation department. Mr. Jamian. Yes, sir. Uh, if you recall in our uh, audit that was done by our con transportation consultant, the main recommendation they had for our transportation department was to get two-way radios in all of our buses. Uh, it's illegal for them to be on a cell phone, and that's all that we're using now while the bus is moving. So if they had to make an emergency call or we had to get in touch with the driver, they had to pull over, stop, answer the phone or either make the call if they had to make a call. So with that, the money was put into the budget for this year for two-way radios. We uh, did an RFP in May and we got three responses, uh, Tomba Communications, Fitzsimmons Radio, and Communication Center slash two-way communication, two different uh, businesses got together to try to supply and, and, and meet what we needed. When we got this, uh, we started evaluating it and we thought that we would go to the 
uh, sheriff department and we would ask them it would be possible for us to use their towers now you know that we got the emergency radios that y'all all approved that each one of our principals are going to have and then some key people in this office will have in case there's an emergency and that's the same towers that those radios use and we work with the sheriff department and we negotiated and we went back and forth and it just they couldn't go any lower because they had so many agencies that already agreed to a certain price that they couldn't give us that discount and and we understand that so we left on good terms but we are now recommending tomba communications who is the only one of the three that met the criteria uh, that we established the other two can only furnish the radios, but they have no towers. And the radios are not going to do us any good without any towers. So uh, by doing this, Tomba Communication and versus what it would have cost us through the Sheriff Department is about $1.5 million difference. So we're recommending Tomba Communications as our two-way radio system, and we need a recommendation on that for tonight if you agree to that. Mr. Harrell? A second, second by Ms. Seeley. And questions and discussion from board members? Ms. Belisari, maybe we ought to go to the uh, sign-in list here on our, can we do that, Ms. Campbell? To speak, yes ma'am. But I already got Ms. Belisari already, is that okay? Yeah, and you can you, you can go ahead and speak and then you can know uh, I just wanted a clarification okay. that's all uh, you mentioned a 1.5 million dollar difference that means an increase over what we had planned to spend actually it's, yes ma'am and, and it's the difference in Tomba communications furnishing the radios the installation with the GPS with maintenance with the towers versus the sheriff department, we still have to buy our radios, right, right. and and using their towers was a difference of 1.5 million dollars. It was a difference in the two, okay, and we so we don't feel that we can spend an additional 1.5 million dollars. Oh, I didn't understand that. That's what you were saying. That's correct. So what are we going to do? We're we're asking for Tomba Communications, which is probably going to be uh, total about over a seven year period is going to be 1.5 million. I think that's what we have. In the budget for that. Okay, I'll reserve some questions for later. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hines. Well, actually, I didn't queue up, but I, I do have a question. Um, is that a local company, Tomba? Yeah, they have sure. a, they have an office here in uh, in New Orleans, but I think they also have one here in Covington or Mandeville too. But is it a national firm? It's international. I've, I've no, never, uh, I've I don't, never heard no, of it. No, I no, I don't, don't think it's a national it's firm. I think it's a state. From I know they have radios in the New Orleans area. Their towers cover way down to New Orleans, all of us, part of Washington Parish, and also into uh, Tangiboa. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bencourt. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Durham. Would you repeat that, Mr. Jobby, about the the 1.5? We're spending less than what the sh what it would have been with the sheriff. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. That's good. Yes, sir. And the, right. and the figure I'm giving you is over a seven-year period, too. Okay. That's equal. You know, <clears> and then year. also, they, I'm sure in there is the range, like they're going to go all the way if, from transportation on 59 there. They cover our entire, entire parish okay. and even further. And Tomba has their own towers yes, scattered sir. around? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Ms. Belisario, you got another question? Sure. Um, these are different from the emergency radio phones that, that you're talking about, or, or will they be? They're the, not as? They're not as expensive. Expensive. <laughs> uh, right. Yes, uh, but they're a two-way communication system. We'll have a base station set up at the transportation department. They'll be able to reach individuals or group or whatever they need to do as far as making calls. And we'll have the GPS system for emergencies where we can locate a bus if we have a breakdown or an accident, that type of thing. Okay, they are two, 
two-way radios, but not necessarily a phone then. They are two-way radios. Right. Okay. Yes, can, they do, can they get 911 if they need? They just have to call transportation the and thought, then we could do the 911. The thought process in our plan is to have at that base station in transportation one of the sheriff's radios that we will be providing for them as well. And the communication will be between bus driver and transportation who will then distribute out to others. It's funny how this all goes in cycles. Back a long time ago when we were doing transportation, that's what everyone had was radios. And then we kind of went away and now we're coming back to that as well. So our plan is to continue at the schools with the direct communication to the sheriff's office and then have transportation buses as well as a base station. And at that base station, that person will have a second radio that's instant communication through the sheriff radio we as well. We just maybe. didn't think the money for the bus situation was the, the right amount to spend for that. Um, it certainly meets the recommendations of the audit. It will allow for the hands-free communication as well, which we know is important. And the GPS component we've seen on studies is important as well. Should there uh, be any incident that needs to be location is important. Thank you. Mr. Hennigan. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jobby, is, is the uh, technology, is it digital and is it uh, like it, a name brand radio out of curiosity? Yes, yes sir. It's digital. Uh, is it a Motorola? I think it's a Motorola radio. Okay. okay. And uh, uh, so there's a state law that says driving a school bus, you can't answer a phone, but you can't answer a radio. Huh? Uh, I, think it's, I think it's a federal law. Federal. It's not just a state law, it's a federal law. Okay. It's it's the difference of key and a mic as opposed to sitting there trying to dial a number. Okay. And if a parent or something has to contact the bus driver, now they may have, the driver may have a cell phone number, but they could also call the central. Uh, they could call. Correct. And, and what we're going to do is look at our hours to make sure that that base station person will be available before bu any bus gets on the road and then stay manning their radios until you know 30 minutes after the last bus ends so that will be our communication from there as well i think it's going to drastically improve our communication between <coughs> the different groups as well as the uh, individual schools it is like a, we've had a couple of weather emergencies and you know we, we want to stay around and make sure everybody is, is is delivered and there's no way to find out unless you call each bus individually have you completed your route where transportation could send an all call and say hey as you finish your route buzz in and let us know and then and know. i mean steve's here too but i mean we'll we're saying don't answer your phone and then don't use your phone and then when there's an emergency we're calling them and saying why do you in touch with you <laughs> so i mean i think this is going to be a little more consistent what our expectations are and and the safety that goes with that yes sir <clears throat> just a uh, if i've done the math right in my head i'm just su i'm surprised that something that you know uh, there's cellular service that acts as a radio and that no one came up with that uh, you think that would have been cheaper but i guess maybe they didn't have the gps that uh uh, was on all the time maybe, maybe yeah that was it right. okay well thank you <laughs> okay uh, mr. nation mr. Jabby uh, just a couple three uh, little questions d related to the the digital do we have a secure channel I mean is that a or a, a channel that belongs just to the it will be yes so there'll be no interference from no from any, anyone else and those and the towers I mean are they what about weather protection for them? I mean, in the event of a hurricane or a ice storm or something like that, are they? I mean, are they secure. <laughs> I guess as secure as they can be. <laughs> well, that's true. They wouldn't be riding the but bus. I mean, it's, it'll be a little different. If I mean, if we have weather stuff, we'll probably not be running well, buses right. anyway. Exactly. True enough. So the sheriff's ones are a different standard for that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I guess the other question is, going back to the, the cost, what is the, just because I'm not clear on this, what is the total cost for the, for the project? The total cost for the seven years is going to be, for us, 848000 about $850,000. The equipment is going to cost about 300000 Right. And then the airtime is going to run, airtime and maintenance for the first three years is about 71000 and then, and that's also the GPS. 
And then after that, the first three years, it goes up to 83000 a year. So the radios, the equipment are, are one-time. That's a one-time. One-time cost, and then there's yearly cost after that. Just like a cellular phone with the airtime that you use, you, you pay a rate for that. And you pay a rate for the GPS. Okay. And it's called real-time GPS. It's, it's really, if, if you're looking at it, it's probably every couple of minutes it updates where everybody is. But if you zone in on one particular vehicle, you can track it real-time as it's moving. Mr. Drucker, I assume Mr. Nation, you're through? Yeah. Okay. Ms. Drucker? Mr. Jabia, I just want to ask you a question in regards to if we add more buses, does it inc is this included in the price? Yes, we can get the radios at that price. And, of course, the airtime, you have to add airtime to that for every one that you get. So any additional equipment you buy, you pay for that equipment, and that additional radio, is going to, you're going to pay airtime for that radio, but at the same rate. Okay, and, proportionate. It, and it's their it's their employees that say for example you have a bus driver who leaves us do we does this company take that radio it, out or is it up to us it, as far as our school system to be responsible for that it's our it's our equipment we pay to have it installed if somebody leaves we're going to pay to take it out but it belongs to us just like the cameras in our buses those belong to us there will be no cost to the bus driver no cost to the bus driver but they're going to be permanently mounted. It's not going to be a portable device. This is going to be mounted in the bus. And that's part of the whole safety to have the hands-free mounted device and right. not a hand, not a. And it's going to be automatic when you crank the bus. The radio is on. And another question for GPS: We'll be able to track every bus driver where they are at yeah. all times. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Right. Well. If they go off the path, we'll find As long out. as that radio is on, we track them. Well, let me be clear that, I mean, the, the intention of the GPS is not to, the in intention of the GPS is to, for safety and to know where our drivers are. We're certainly not putting a GPS to track every movement of every bus driver it's for safety reasons and issues that may come up. I don't think we're going to spend time just watching at the screen of where they no. go from no. mile no. to mile. Right. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Kuzan. Mr. Javier, the money is already set aside for this project in the budget, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Bettencourt. <clears throat> thank you again, Mr. Durham. But another couple of questions, either you or Mr. Alfonso. Will the person at the base, would be, they be able to contact like every bus at once for some kind of emergency or whatever, or you have to do it individually? Can do it all at once. Okay. And then also answering or responding back and forth, that's still going to be the handheld mic? Yes, sir. Okay. There's nothing else on the market besides that, huh? There were... I think what were they mic? They were the uh, lapel. Did they have the mic that for the lapel type thing? But it's still going to be a mic. Still going to have to key it to, to talk. Okay. It's not like a a voice activated mic where right. it comes on when you talk. Thank you, Mr. Womack. Pete, that, that Nextel technology doesn't exist anymore. We can, we don't have Nextel covers throughout this parish. That was our problem with Nextels. Oh. Uh -huh. Okay. Mr. Herzing? How many channels? I don't know that. Do you know the channels? I just know that the capability, the capability with the radio is just like y'all were saying, can we give out a mass message at one time? We can do that. But then there's also going to be the capability where we're speaking to maybe a, a talk group or a single bus owner operator. Okay. But I do have a concern. We do need to have a backup channel on this. Once one goes down, it might get keyed up wrong. We'll and find out. We'll okay, find out before right. the board meeting and let you know that for sure. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Kuzan. I'd like to call for a question. I'd, I'd like to have a question before. I'd like to ask a question before we do that. Thank you. Being as I was running the meeting, I was letting everybody else ask their questions. Okay. I appreciate it, though. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I'm up. 
Mr. Javi. Yes, sir. When we were talking about the group capabilities of talking, do the bus drivers have the ability to talk to each other? Or does no, that have they to have to go through the base. Which is a good thing. I understand that. Right. So th that's, There'll be some that training. Was, that was one of my questions. Right. But, uh, and the other one was about whether or not the equipment was permanently mounted. So Yes, sir. We're good. Yes, sir. Okay, Mr. Kuzan, I'm through. Now, we will have with this some portable radios that we'll have here in our office that we also can make contact with the drivers or the base station if we need to. Excellent. Or our investigators who well. Right, or the, in, yeah, they can go out, the field personnel, right. they go out right. and do inspections or Correct. whatever it may be. Correct. Okay, thank you, very good. Any other questions from board members? Seeing none from the board member, any from the public? Seeing none from there, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Abstain? So ordered. Up. Oh, Ms. Heinz abstains. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, moving to item seven, which is Mr. Javi again, administrative monthly maintenance and custodial report, Mr. Javi. As you know, that's sent to you electronically. Uh, Mr. Singletary and his staff is here if you have any questions. Any questions from board members? Seeing none, Mr. Javia. Uh, Mr. Gaspard is here for the risk management report if you have any questions. Any questions for Mr. Gaspard? Seeing none, Mr. Javia. Uh, transportation report is in your packet. Mr. Alfonso is here if you have any questions. Any questions regarding transportation other than what we just spoke of? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Javier. Thank you. All right, we're moving to item eight, which is our construction report. Ms. Tipton. Thank you, Mr. Derman. Um, first item tonight is consideration of bids for Lancaster Elementary Classroom Wing Additions at your desk or tonight is a memo from me to Mr. Fols. We did receive bids for the Lancaster Elementary School uh, Classroom Wing Edition on December 17th. And those bids um, were a nice gift ahead of the holidays. We're recommending acceptance of the low base bid, alternate number one and alternate number two, submitted by Omega General Construction LLC in the amount of $4,630,000 for the classroom wing addition at Lancaster Elementary School, St. Tammany Parish School Board Project number 1493. Ms. Drucker? Would you like to make a so Okay. Second. Second moved by Ms. Drucker, second by Ms. Seely. Any <laughs> comments or questions from board members? Ms. Belisario. Perhaps I missed it. Uh, what are alternates one and two? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So the base bid is this structure will be a two story structure. We will be finishing out the second floor with classrooms. The base bid is eight classrooms, and each alternate adds an additional two classrooms. So tonight's recommendation will be 12 classrooms total. Um, the first floor will be um, not finished out, but we'll have restrooms, and it'll be used as an open air um, kind of classroom or playground area, and it could later be finished out as another 12 classrooms uh, as or when needed. Okay, and also, what was the estimated cost of the project? Um, the estimate um, was $5 million and our budget was $5.5. So these were good numbers. It was a good, good Christmas present numbers. It's almost like after Christmas sale, yeah. <laughs> but it was before Christmas. Okay, any other comments or questions from board members? Ms. Heinz. Ms. Tipton, would you refresh my memory on who the original contractor was? Lancaster. The um, original, the school that's there was built by Donahue Favre, and the architect is Gasway Bankston, and they're the same architect for the uh, addition. Thank you. Any other questions from board members? Seeing none, any from the public? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? So ordered. And did y'all notice that Cameron didn't even have to look at notes when she answered you with that question like that? <laughs> I went over that with her this afternoon to make sure she was uh, she was prepared for that. <laughs> yeah. Excellent job, Mr. Folsom is always so preparing the staff. 
Thank you. Uh, yeah, I bet. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ms. Tipton, the general construction report here. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, our interior finishes work is underway on the Clearwood Junior High Edition. The contractor has removed most of the modular construction at Fountain Blue Junior High to make way for the main new building site area. The building at Chifuncta Middle is almost closed in, and at Pontchartrain Elementary, the roof is nearing completion. Exterior insulation board is being installed. Um, at both schools, block work, rough end of electrical, mechanical, and plumbing is progressing. The contractor for Mandeville Elementary Addition has completed the building slab and is erecting structural steel now. The structural steel for the kitchen is being erected at Abney Elementary, and the ductwork and electrical and mechanical are being roughed in in the cafeteria seating area. The second floor slab for Lyon Elementary project was poured prior to the holidays, and the contractor is working on the roof structure and has set the door frames and is laying concrete block on the first floor. The building structure is in place for the administration building at Shata Ema Elementary, and the contractor is also working on the renovations to the existing building area as well. The contractor for Carolyn Park Middle School is working in the area that will be the new kitchen and is planning to pour the new slab in that area in the next couple of weeks. The HVAC system replacement projects for Covington High, Slidell Jr. and Bonnie Cole are on schedule and are progressing well. The tennis court project for Pearl River High is underway. The design team has been making renovations to the documents for Pearl River High renovations and additions project, and we expect to see a review set of those documents in the next couple of weeks. We continue to work through the annexation process for the Boyette <coughs> Junior and Little Oak Middle Utilities project. A final progress set of plans for Slidell High have been submitted to our office for review, and the Mandeville Junior High Renovation Project documents are being reviewed by the State Fire Marshal. The Mayfield Elementary Additions Project has been advertised for bids, and a pre-bid meeting was actually held today. The School Administration Maintenance, IT, CNI Supervisors, and the Construction Supervisor met prior to the holidays to plan and schedule the move for Madisonville Elementary School, and we are planning to make that move next Friday. Be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Any question, Ms. Seeley? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Tipton. Um, the question I have is once the documents have been completed, how quickly can we rebid this? Well, certainly we want to get it back out for bid as quickly as we can. We'd like to see the documents come in and get a chance to review them, but I, I feel confident that we'll have them out for bid here in the next month, I would think, and maybe sooner. And the bid process is approximately how long? The bid process, once the project is advertised, um, the project by law will have to be advertised for a minimum of 25 days. With a big renovation job, we often consider it needing a little bit more time for proper bids um, okay. to give the contractors some time to look at that. So, um, and then it still has to come before the board. So that whole process can take 45 to 60 days once it's advertised and before it gets to the board. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from board members? Okay, seeing none, Ms. Tipton, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, item nine is uh, business affairs, Ms. Prevost. The purchasing report is in your packets and Mrs. Stevens is here to answer any questions you may have. Any questions from board members? Okay. They letting you off light starting the year that way. Okay. Announcements from the board president, Mr. Luke. Thank you, Mr. Dermott. I'm sorry. Wait. Wait, Jack. Hold on. I'm sorry. We found out the information we had it here is 32 channels. Thank you. Okay, Jack. You're up now. Okay. See if Thank you. Can you top that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> regular school board meeting will be held next Thursday, January 14th at 7 p.m. in the central office. The uh, following Thursday, January 21st, we have expulsion appeals at 6 o'clock. On Friday, January 15th, we have the installation luncheon for the West Chamber. You have a flyer in your packet. Please get it to Karen if you plan on attending uh, for that luncheon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Loop. Appreciate it very much. Mr. Foles. 
Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Durbin. Board members, as we close, you know, I think everyone's aware that next week there will be inaugurations both on the parish level as well as the state level, and we'll be um, swearing in a new governor. I attended an event after Governor Edwards was elected, of course, before he took office, and he, he made a statement to that group that day, and I want to close this meeting with this, and I think it's encouraging for us as a public school system, public school board, school board employees, and his statement was, Whatever success I've had in my life, I've attributed to teachers. I respect teachers and know what a powerful role teachers play. We have to band together. I still believe in the power and promise of public education. So as someone that each one of us in this room also believes in the power and promise of public education, we're certainly excited about the opportunities that are ahead for this school system. And um, we, I think we'll be involved in many of the good things that are going to be going on over the next few years. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Foles. And with nothing else coming before this committee, we're adjourned.